Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Eric Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit ibethel.org. I was in Michigan, Kalamazoo, and uh, many of you know that we've been going after um, a specific type of miracle regarding Asperger's, autism, uh, bipolar, dyspraxia, a variety of those um, a lot this year, and many of you know, I, in my Bible, I have a couple of handwritten letters of people that have been completely healed from bipolar, um, autism, Asperger's, etc. I have text messages and pictures of text messages of the same, and we've been ser- sharing them for here and on the road, and what I try to do whenever I travel especially is I try to share these testimonies at the beginning of the message for one main reason. Could I have people, um, we pray for people, and then text the family or the individual to, hey, we just prayed for you. Do you notice anything? And then I instruct people that by the end of the message, when I get down to the front, please come find me and tell me if anything has happened. What's important to understand, too, is I not personally have not yet seen someone get completely healed 100% of any of these conditions. It doesn't mean it hasn't happened or it can't happen. That's just my experience. The reason why I think that's important to recognize sometimes, and that we should expect a full miracle right out the gate, but sometimes we need to look for the subtle breakthroughs and little subtle changes because what I've seen most, in fact, everyone that completely healed or experienced massive breakthrough, it happened incrementally over a week, maybe two weeks, even up to a month or so. So that's why it's really important. And so last last Sunday I was in Michigan and I shared shared the series of testimonies that I'd normally share of the South African gal, the gal from Norway, uh, from, uh, the guy from Ireland, and someone here in our own church, and many more now. I shared them, and then I had people stand up, did the whole thing. Well, somebody came up to me after the message, and it was a, an older couple. I'm guessing in their 60s and 70s. And the man was so, he was holding his phone, and he was trying to tell me what had just happened. But he was so shocked and taken aback by what had happened that he didn't fully tell me what happened. So he kind of sits on the front row, just like almost in shock. I can't believe this is happening. And I'm like trying to figure out, well, what happened? He just, he's not talking, and his wife is trying to tell me. And then they mention the person's name. Well, to the right of me, there was a, a gal probably maybe 10 feet away. She's in her 20s, and she overheard the name. She said, wait, what name, are you, what name did you say to the gentleman sitting down? And he repeats the name. She said, oh, I got a text from the same person as well. What had happened, they both stood up for this one individual. They don't know each other, but they both know the same person. And this person, I believe, if I remember correctly, in their 20s, is non-communicative, doesn't talk and does not interact with anybody, completely shut down and incapacitated in many ways. And so what had happened is we prayed at the beginning of the message. By the end of the message, they were both getting text messages from the family members We don't know what's happened, but so-and-so is talking for the last 30, 40 minutes. Went from non-communicative to now talking. It's amazing. So if you have anybody in your family, neighbors, friends, acquaintances that have autism, Asperger's, bipolar, dyspraxia, and if you've been here long enough, you understand that sometimes when we give a word of knowledge about something specific like the right shoulder, and someone says, well, my left shoulder, like, take it, shoulder, it's close enough. <laughs> so the same principle applies to this. If there's anything relating to this learning disorder, anything out yourself or someone that you know, go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to pray right now, and we're going to pray for an incredible Christmas gift to be given to this person and family, that this would be an amazing Christmas break of miracles and breakthroughs in these areas. Some of my favorite ones are where certain people go back to their psychologist or their mental doctors, and the doctors undiagnose them with the condition. That's happened. And so I'm believing that to happen right now. And so if you're by someone that's standing, you know what to do. Put your hand on them. If you're not, just extend a hand. We're going to pray a really simple, simple prayer, and then we'll get into the Word. Father, we thank you that you're the healing God. And we declare this morning... Over every person that's represented right now, we plead the blood of Jesus over them. We declare healing and wholeness to their mind, their body, and their spirit. We declare breakthrough in the name of Jesus, that any symptom condition would be completely eradicated and they would be restored to full health and wholeness. 
in Jesus' name. Wherever they are at in the world right now, we ask that the healing power of Jesus would meet them right where they are at. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Go ahead and grab a seat. As you're sitting down, please grab your phones right now and text the family or the friends or whoever. Just text them. Let them know that you just stood and prayed for them. And then ask them a question. Please let us know if anything's happened in the next 30, 40 minutes. And if something happened in the next 30, 40 minutes, I want to ask that you come to the front and show me your phones or text messages. Every time that I've done this or we've done this, minimum of one up to four people every time come up at the end of a service and say, look at this text message. And so we've seen this consistently, and I want to keep going after it, especially we end this year, but as we go into 2019, we're going to see an increase of miracles. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles, why don't you get it open to Luke chapter 2. We're going to start there, and then we're going to find ourselves in Genesis. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in these days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinus was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Verse 5, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. As I was getting ready for this morning all week, I was, I got into yesterday and I actually was struggling to, pre- to preach or to talk about what I'm going to talk about. And the real reason was I, I didn't feel much like a Christmas message. And I know we're not the most thematic holiday preaching kind of people. People give us a hard time. Like, how come on Easter you guys don't actually talk about Easter? And we're like, Easter every day. <laughs> and it's true. But I did, I was feeling the sense of Christmas, especially with Christmas is really close to this day. I was struggling last night with actually, I don't, this doesn't feel like much of a Christmas message. I feel like the Holy Spirit said, yeah, but this is your best Christmas gift. I said, okay, all right. So we know that when Jesus was born and he lived 33 years on this earth, that he not only changed the game, he changed everything in existence. He answered every existential question any human being will ever ask. He answered every question. He is the solution. He is the reason for everything. And what's so amazing to me is that he's so consumed with the vastness of what he's created, and he's as equally consumed with you as an individual. That his, he is so much into the big that he cares so much about the small. And this morning, I want to share a sincere, uh, genuine, and honestly, a vulnerable message with you. So you have to bear with me for a little bit. I've got you trapped in this room for 41 minutes. In Isaiah, and I thank you for that clap. It was awesome. The timing timing was impeccable. I'm just playing. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. I want you to highlight or make a note of these two phrases, wonderful counselor and prince of peace. I met those two this year. (laughs) Sorry. In Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 23, I haven't even gotten to the hard part yet. The steadfast is my third time too. I'm going to be like a raw nerve by the end of this day. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That was my grand, that was grandpa's favorite hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. We sang that a million times before he passed away. In Genesis chapter 32, if you want to go ahead and turn there, we're going to read the first seven verses and then we're going to unpack a story that is quite profound. 
especially for right now. Genesis chapter 32. Let's read verse 1. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp, and he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. <clears throat> and the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau. And he also is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Verse 7, so Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Let's read that again. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. I realize many in this room have read this story. Maybe not recently, but you've read it before. And some of you have never read this story. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we're talking about one of the patriarchs of our faith, Jacob. Why would Jacob afraid and distressed in this moment? We have to actually go back. In this moment, he's actually 97 years old. 97 by now. You see, Jacob is the twin of another guy named Esau. And when their mother, Rebecca, was pregnant with the both of them, there's a verse a few chapters earlier, or a story a few chapters earlier, where Rebecca says, what is going on with these babies? They are constantly fighting and warring in my womb. Now, I know mothers in this room, you know what that feels like, but if you can imagine, you recognize this is not normal movement in the womb. This is, these, two, these two babies are going at it. And in this moment of like confusion, the Lord speaks to Rebecca, and she says this, there are two nations inside of you. One of them will go this way, the other one will go this way, and the younger will serve the older. So now Rebecca has this prophetic word. I'm sure it helped for context, but I don't think it alleviated the war. So sometime later, she gives birth, and, and this weird thing takes place. Esau comes out, and then Jacob is still in the womb, reaches out of the womb, and grabs his brother's ankle. That's like alien movie stuff right there. <laughs> Imagine what Rebecca and Isaac are like. And the story goes that Jacob wants to come out first, and he's trying to pull his brother back in. That's how these two guys start their relationship. <laughs> now the Bible moves on and tells that Isaac favored Esau. That Esau became the favorite. He was the oldest. He was a hunter-gatherer. He was incredibly hairy, which we're going to revisit that point in just a moment. Extremely hairy. They said he came out covered in hair. Not just on the head, but everywhere. And then Jacob comes out. And, and so as Esau is the father's favorite, Jacob is not a hunter-gatherer. He is more of a home-dweller. He's more of a person that stays at home with the mom. So Jacob, if you can imagine, he's been raised with a very interesting dynamic, what we would probably say a dysfunctional family. So here you have, you have Jacob, who is raised with the idea and the reality that his father does not favor him. He's raised with the idea that his brother has all the favor. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have the mother who is carrying this prophetic word about actually Jacob, the one that Esau's going to serve. So you've got this very interesting dynamic in there. Jacob's worldview, his value for self, his value and ability to receive and give love is shaped from a very, very early age. So here we are 97 years later and Jacob is freaked out of his mind. He's got 97 years of baggage. And so as Isaac is favoring Esau, Rebecca is trying to figure out the mom. She's trying to figure out, how do I get Jacob on top? How do I get him on top of the pile? What's interesting is as you study Isaac, you'll learn that Isaac was incredibly passive. He was not a strong leader. He wasn't a strong dad. He's very passive. In this culture, day and age, when a man would go find his wife, a man would pursue the wife and they would go to the spring or a well and find their woman. And so all the fathers before Isaac, that's what they did. You go to the well, and there's your wife. I want to marry you, and think the history is written. But Isaac didn't even go to the well. Isaac stays home. And so a servant is sent to find Isaac's wife. 
So here you have a picture of Isaac, who's not a, he's a passive individual. And sometimes in the place of passivity, the opposite person, the spouse, will become incredibly controlling and manipulative. So here you have a passive dad, and you have, in this case, a controlling mom. I think she had good intentions. I think she did what she thought she was supposed to do, but she did it in a way that was pretty deceptive. And unbeknownst to her, she raised a kid named Jacob whose name was Deceiver. Jacob became a master deceiver, a master manipulator. He became excellent at that craft. And the first place that you see it take place is Esau is out on a hunting trip, and he comes back in, and he is so exhausted. The verse says this, Esau said, I'm going to die if I don't eat something. He is incredibly desperate for a meal. And his brother Jacob goes, I'll give you a meal if you sell me your birthright or give me your birthright. And Esau, in his stupidity and naiveness and honestly just ignorance, said, that's fine, which revealed that he didn't have much of a value for his birthright or he was so exhausted his mind was not working properly. You pick, but either way, he sold, he sold the birthright. So Jacob's first major act of deception won him something very valuable. So what do you think Jacob did the rest of his life? I know how to get what I need. I become the master deceiver. I will find a way to get it from you. So sometime later, approximately according to my study, 70 years, when Jacob is around 70-something years old, Rebecca's mo- the mom, he overhears a conversation with Isaac and Esau. And this is what the conversation goes like. Isaac said, Esau, I'm blind and I'm about to pass. Would you please make me a meal so I can bless you? And Esau's like, the day has come. Been waiting for this moment. And so Esau heads out of the room and he goes on a, tr- a hunting trip to get some food to come back. Well, Rebecca overhears what's taking place. Remember, she had the prophetic word. And she said, oh, this is the moment. So she gets Jacob to Jacob. Your brother just went out. He's going to be out for a little bit. Make a meal and now put some animal fur on you. Cover yourself in animal fur. Go into your dad and give him the plate of food. Remember, Isaac can't see. So everything is by sound or touch. To show you how hairy Esau was, you have to wear animal fur. That's quite hairy. And so Jacob cooks a meal, he comes in, he sits down, and, and Isaac said, oh, I'm so thankful for this meal. And just to confirm if it was his son Esau, he reaches out and touches, oh, he touches a lot of hair. He thinks, yep, this is my boy. This is my boy. He eats the meal, and then he blesses who he thought was Esau, but it was Jacob. And so Jacob leaves the room, and literally as he's leaving the room, Esau comes in, And Esau sits down. He went hunting, cooked a meal, sits down, and he sits next to Isaac and says, all right, Father, I'm ready for the blessing. And he goes, I've already already blessed Esau. And Esau goes, no, 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 I'm Esau. He said, I've already blessed Esau. And then the lights went on. They realized Jacob had deceived his own father. Now Esau is ticked. Esau is irate because he lost his birthright in his own ignorance and stupidity. And now the blessing. If we don't even understand the power of blessing. In our Western culture, we don't understand the power. It is so powerful that Isaac said, once I've given it, I can't give it to anyone else. That revealed that we're missing an understanding of the power of blessing. And I'm praying that in the coming days and months that we get a greater understanding of what a father's blessing really is. It's one of those things you can feel it, but you can't explain it. Like, I don't know how to tangibly make sense to you, but I know it's real. So this is one of those moments. But Esau, in his anger, he makes this statement. He says, I am going to kill my brother Jacob once my father passes. Well, Rebecca hears that, the mom, and tells Jacob, you need to run for your life. Go to such and such place to some distant relatives. So Jacob packs up his stuff and heads out, and Esau is just biding time until his father passes so he can have his own revenge. And so fast forward the story, Jacob ends up at a well. Why? Because he wants a wife. And he sees this beautiful girl named Rachel. And he said, I want to marry that girl. So he gets introduced to the family. He discusses with Laban. 
and says, uh, I want to marry your daughter. And Laban said, um, how much do you have? And they worked out a deal where Jake would work for seven years. He worked for seven years for Rachel. So he goes to work. He works for seven years. Seven years goes by. And this is one of the weirdest stories in the Old Testament. Jacob gets married, who he thinks is Rachel, but it's not. It's Leah, the older sister. Has sex with her on the first night, wakes up in the morning and goes, wait a second, this is not Rachel. I, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I have so many questions. Did anybody else have, anybody else have questions? I'm like, how do you get yourself in that position? So he wakes up like, what the heck, Laban? This is not Rachel. I worked seven years for her. And Laban revealed, well, in our culture, in our, in our family, we can't marry off the youngest unless the oldest has been married off. Isn't it interesting that Jacob, the great deceiver, just found his match? Yeah. Isn't it interesting that sometimes in life you find your match? Sometimes in life, your own issues, you find someone that's even better at it than you. That's a whole message in itself, not for today. So he meets his map. So Jacob is now like, I got to out-deceive this guy. So the next plan was, I want Rachel. And Laban said, well, seven more years. He said, fine, seven more years. So now 14 years total. Now you have two wives and a couple servants. And, and there's this conflict happening. And, and so Joseph and, I'm sorry, Jacob and Laban make a discussion. Laban had a bunch of flock and cattle, etc. And they wanted to see it multiply. And so Jacob, in his deceiving skill set, goes, I have an idea. Let me take over the flock. I will multiply them. But here's the deal. The spotted speckled ones I take, and the ones that are not spotted and speckled, you take. And Laban's like, Let's, I'm good with that. This guy's a hard worker. I'm keeping him on my staff. So Jacob then goes down to the watering trough. He takes sticks and branches, creates spots and speckles on them, lays them around the watering hole. And the theory was that the, the animals that drink from that watering trough that stare at the spotted speckled branches would produce spotted speckled cattle, flock, etc. It's one. Of the, it, this whole story is weird. Everything in this story is so weird. And I love it. And so sure enough, six years go by, and Laban takes a step back and takes inventory and says, Something's off. And what was off? The spotted speckled flock was enormous, bigger than the flock that it was hid. And now he feels like Jacob is a threat to his dynasty, to his wealth. And so long story short, Jacob takes off running. And that's where we pick up in the story right here in the beginning of Genesis chapter 32. Jacob would have been running for 97 years. 97 years. You know why he's afraid? Because he had deceived everyone in his life. He manipulated everyone in his life. He was the wealthiest, considered the wealthiest man in his time. He had built up a resume like no one else's business. And what we find out is that his wealth and resume is what he hid it behind to not reveal his internal dysfunction. So after he finds out Esau's coming, they're greatly afraid. So he begins to cry out to God. And then as he had done for 97 years of his life, he took matter into his own hands. And he thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my wealth and my family. I'm going to split them in two, put one over here, one over here. And if Esau attacks one of them, then the other one can escape. And then he goes, actually, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to send massive amounts of gifts to my brother. I'm going to try to appease him, to amend the years of thievery and deception. 97 years. Imagine the hatred that's in Esau's heart right now. He's been waiting for this moment. But he comes up with a strategic, but I want to give Jacob some credit, a pretty brilliant plan. He said, let's send out a bunch of gifts, but let's do it in a procession. Let's not send it all at one. Let's send it little by little. So he organized. He said, all right, send that one. Okay, wait a little while. Let them get out farther in the valley. Okay, now send the next one. Okay, now, and he, why? Because you want there to be this feeling of never-ending wealth that is coming. So Esau would be like, dang, my brother had got it going on. He is trying to prove himself by his wealth, his exterior blessing. And all the while, he's actually hiding in a massive internal dysfunction. And so there comes a point in verse 22. Let's read this one together. And he arose that night and took his two wives his two female servants, 
and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had had. Then Jacob was left alone. Jacob was left alone. There comes a point in each one of our life where you have to be alone with God. In May of this year, I posted something last week. I said this has been probably one of the greatest years, but it's also been the worst for me. In May this year, I started, uh, Saturday moved to Saturday morning. I could take you back to the moment. I started having chest pains. And I've never had chest pain before. I've never had, I've never had a physical manifestation of anxiety and stress. In fact, I didn't even know it was that. I'm like, oh, maybe it's heartburn or something. Maybe it's just that. And so I kind of just brushed it off and thought I'll just kind of go through my day. And several days went by, and I noticed my breathing was affected. And I'm like, something's, something's not right. So I remember mentioning to Candace, like, I've got this. Just tons of pressure on my chest. I can't breathe and blah, blah, blah. So May comes around. June comes around. Instead of it being every now and then, it was 24-7. July comes around, and I'm like, oh, it's getting heavier, and my breathing, it's just not good. And so car fire happened. It's like, all right, we're just going to stuff this down for a while now because our city's on fire. We're in a massive tragedy. Understandable. But once the fire kind of passed, I fell apart. I met myself. Around that time, I decided, uh, with the help of Candace, and I told our leadership team, I said, guys, I'm, I'm falling apart. And so I... I let go of a ton of my responsibilities. We restructured some stuff just to minimize my, the weight, which helped. It totally helped, but it wasn't fixing the problem, of course. And so I finally got a hold of a professional counselor, a psycho- Christian psychologist. She happened to live in, uh, in the Midwest. And I remember that first phone call with her. And I remember, <laughs> I remember sitting in my truck. It was the only private place I could have. I, was, I was lost it. Weeping. I just wept and wept, and half of me is half of me is like, You're fine, you're fine, suck it up, you're fine. The other half, like, No, you're not, you're so jacked up. <laughs> I listened to that voice. And so I just I just wept and wept, and I think by the second counseling appointment the chest pain started to get less. Obviously super happy. By that point, I had lost control of my thoughts. I had, I had lost control of controlling my thoughts. Super scary. And I remember my days were measured by how long can I stall a thought that triggers me? How long can I like not think about anything so I don't get triggered? And so that caused me, understandably so, to create lots of distance from anything. I mean... If something was out of place, anxiety would jack up. If the yard wasn't mowed, I, lost my, I was losing my mind. If there was animal hair that didn't get vacuumed up on the floor, it'd drive me insane. I'm like, I need some help. <laughs> and so if I had thought nine in the morning, I thought, this is going to be a really long day. This can be the longest day of my life. If I had a thought at six at night, I thought, okay, I'm going to bed soon. It won't be as bad. But that's how every day was for me, just trying to manage that. Obviously, I'm shutting down, just trying to stay out of tension. I'm, I'm talking with my counselor. And, and so she gave me some exercises to do every morning. I still do them. I might do them for the rest of my life. But so every morning I get up. I get up early every morning anyway to do my devotion. But they, became, they just became moments with the Lord. I'd read my Bible and then... You see, what I was trying to do is avoid the chest pain. What can I do to get rid of this chest pain? I'm wired in such a way that, like, if there's a problem, let's fix it. Let's, let's bring out whatever tools necessary and let's fix it. And I learned that this can't be fixed by the strength that I have with also my greatest weakness. And so I showed my counselor, she said, you actually need to stop avoiding that chest pain. 
you need to go into that chest pain. I said, what are you talking about? I'm scared to death because I can't breathe. I don't know if I'm going to make it. She said, no, 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 you need to focus on that chest pain and you need to go into it and God will reveal to you what's causing it. So every morning, it was something new every morning. I had emotions come out of me I did not know existed in me. Because I've always had that voice that told me, you're not supposed to feel that way. That's not, that's not how we men of character do it. Does that sound familiar? And I realized that wasn't wisdom. That wasn't, that wasn't good. That was just stuffing and stuffing and stuffing and stuffing. So I had to come face to face with, wow, I've got a lot of emotion that I didn't realize I had. I didn't even know I was stuffing it. I mean, if I knew I was stuffing it, I would have dealt with it whenever, but I didn't know that. And so every morning I have these, these moments, and then once I got to the sword, the Holy Spirit got to the sword, my job was to go, Holy Spirit, what do you say about this? Some days he said a lot, and some days he said nothing. And this became my daily routine. Sometime during the day, if something would trigger me, I'd have to stop, pull off to the side, go into my chest pains, and say, all right, Holy Spirit, what do you say about that? And that became my rhythm. So chest pains now are, are going away. In the middle of September, we had a big dinner party at our house. And I mean, I, I, you know, probably a bad timing, but summer was ending and fall was starting, and I wanted, we wanted to have some friends over. But I have nothing to give. I mean, I, I am completely empty, maybe even negative. And so I had planned my Saturday to set up my backyard, and I had, what would take me normally an hour, I gave it three hours. Just, just so I wouldn't lose it. And so I'm in the backyard. I'm taking my time. I'm going to take a nap around noon for two or three hours. I was just going to pace it and just get myself to do the evening. I really was looking forward to friends coming over. And so about midway through the morning, about noon actually, I go into the garage, and we have a bathroom in our garage, and there's a toilet. And I walk in the garage to grab some tools, and there, my toilet backing up, and raw sewage is coming out. All of them, whatever then my septic tank was now in my garage. Sorry for the graphicness. And I'm, I lost it. I started hyperventilating. I started panicking. I started. <laughs> all right. I was losing it. So Cam just like, it's okay. We'll just call a guy. I know she was trying to help, but I, would, I was just not there. Looking back, I'm like, totally, you just call a guy. But in that moment, I was losing it. I'm panicking. I'm going 100 miles an hour trying to figure out what to do. And so I finally call a company, and I laugh now because that was a funny two-hour moment in our life. My wife is so gracious. Where's the pick? I can't find the pick. Look, I'll go buy a pick. I mean, I was, just, I was losing it. So I call a company and say, we're booked. Can't come till tomorrow. I'm like, no, I need someone now. We've got a group coming over, and there's poop everywhere. And so I call another company, and they said, we'll be out in an hour and a half. Great. I'll be there in... And I'm still panicking for the next hour because I'm trying to find how to get to the septic. Well, it's a long story. While well, Candace is buying the pick and the whole deal. And the guy pulled up, big poop truck pulled up. <laughs> and this really large man gets out. His name is Raul, big Mexican guy. And Raul comes, and I didn't know. I found out what I looked like because what he said, he looked at me and said, you all right? <laughs> and I said, I said, Oh, no, I'm so stressed right now. So he comes over to my driveway, puts his hand on my shoulder, and looks at me, and he goes, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. As far as I'm concerned, he's an angel from heaven. I wanted to kiss him. I wanted to embrace him. Raul became my best friend in that moment. And so I took Raul to the backyard, and what, I, what baffled me the most, he was so dang happy. How in the world are you that happy with this job? I, I just couldn't figure it out. I didn't care. I was like, I just want to, I just want to, I just feel, I could feel coming off of him. So he got going. He was doing his starting to pump everything out. And so I'm, I'm trying to get back to functioning. I'm trying to get my backyard ready. And, and then uh, he's done. Hey, Eric, I'm done. I'm going to wrap up. So thanks. I go over. And I look down the septic tank, the huge septic tank. I look down. It's now empty. And I heard the Holy Spirit say this. That's what I'm doing to you. I'm pumping so much stuff out. Now, I don't know why God showed the septic tank. I mean, it could have been a little nicer. 
But I hung, on, I hung on to that statement for months. Anytime something flare up, he's pumping it up. He's yeah. pumping it up. The other thing you told me, he said, Eric, you have, I'm giving you a brand new operating system. The operating system you've had got you to this point in life, and it's worked. But where we're going, it won't get you there. So that's when I knew it was going to be a stripping process. I thought it would get better, it got worse. Oftentimes when we get out of pain, and I know this from a physical, I've had chiropractic stuff over the years, and sometimes we get out of pain, we stop getting help. And so I knew principally, like, when, even when you're out of pain, you have to continue to get help. That's really good. And I knew that, so I go, okay. Yeah. And I was like, man, chest pain, I can breathe again, I'm starting to function, and, but man, there was a lot of distance between me and everything. And you guys know me pretty well, like I love hanging out after church. As soon as I was done with church, I'm out. I, I couldn't handle any interaction. So if I've been short with you in the last eight months, I, please accept my apology. <laughs> and so that happened, and then there was a 10-day stretch that was the dark night of the soul. The last three days were, for me, were the worst ever. I've never had that experience in my life. I had never been that low. And I remember sitting there for three days. It was on a weekend. Not that, not that long ago, just a few weeks ago. That's why it's so fresh. And I remember my counselor saying, you know, you need to move from doing to being. And so I knew that I did my devotion, I did my tool, I did everything and nothing was working. But I trusted that his mercies were new every morning. And I trusted that if I just keep walking through this and not try to skip it or get around it or get through it too quick, that it eventually would pass. So this was just a few weekends ago. And I walked to my garage Saturday night. Guess what I found? Oh, yeah, more sewage. <laughs> toilet backing up poop and toilet paper and everything you can imagine is all over my garage again. I'm like, dear God. But I didn't hyperventilate. I didn't panic. I didn't, I just went, whatever, I'll call a plumber. And so I called this guy up and this guy named John pulled up. And again, John is the happiest dude in town. I'm like, these septic plumber guys, there's something going on there. They're just happy. And so... I called him up, hey man, my toilet's backing up, I just got my septic pumped and blah, blah, blah. So he comes over and, and the septic tank's fine. He said, some, he explained, sometimes when you have a backup from the septic tank, it can create a blockage, blah, blah, blah. And so he runs his stuff down the line to see where the blockage was and he said, oh yeah, there was a blockage. And when he opened the pipe, you can look in the pipe and it's just standing water, which means it's not moving, it's just sitting there. And he said, yeah, that, that's what's going on. I said, great, just, just fix it. So he ran his snake down the line, unplugged it, and now I see water flowing. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, that'll take care of it. I woke up the next morning a different guy. So here you have, <laughs> Jacob had to wrestle with God at some point. It took him 97 years, but he had to have that moment. So here he is wrestling with God in this moment because he is freaked out of his mind. He has spent his entire life doing things in his own efforts. He, he had, he's made mess after mess after mess after mess, and he realized, I can't move on. And the key was he had to get alone. I believe every man and woman has to be alone with the Lord at some point. You have to let God introduce you to yourself. I'm all about counselors, and I know my counselor's watching right now. I owe her a lot. And I couldn't have done it without her and the people in my life. There's no question. But there's certain things that you can't do with the help of people. It has to be just you and God. And he has to be the one to introduce to you that's underneath layers of life. So Jacob is wrestling with a man, then an angel, and then we find out it's God. And God's like, hey, I got to go. This has been fun. The sun's about to come up. I need to leave the wrestling match. Which I find so funny. Like, why did God ask for permission to leave a wrestling match. And so Jacob, who is known as the great deceiver, is wrestling with God in this moment. And God's like, I gotta go. And Jacob's like, you're not going until you bless me. 
which is really intriguing because Jacob had all the wealth in the world, had the birthright, had the blessing of Isaac, one of the great patriarchs of our faith. He had everything you could ever want, but he was missing the most important thing. So he held on, and God said, fine, you want this, and then he dislocates his hip, and then he blesses him. He changed his name from Jacob to Israel. He went from the great deceiver, incredibly independent, doing his own thing his own way, and then he became a man that was fully dependent on the Lord. And Jacob limped the rest of his life. So the question I'm asking myself, I think we should all ask ourselves is this. Do we want to not have a limp and hide our dysfunction? Or is it worth getting a limp to be free? I've heard it said before, don't trust a man or a woman that doesn't limp. There's a lot of truth in that. And so Jacob wakes up in the morning. He recognizes the way he walks is going to be different the rest of his life. The way that he gets places, the way that he gets things done changes. And I think that's the thing. You realize when you have a match with God, you do life different from there on out. And Jacob knew that. He walked with a limp. The way he approached stairs, the way he, the way he timed everything changed from that point on. It affected everything. So now you've got to go meet his brother. Now you've got to go out and face his greatest fear. And that man on the other side of the valley has every right to kill him. And he's ticked. He's got 400 men. He's got his army around him. So instead of Jacob hiding behind his wealth, he said, actually, I'm going to go out front. So he goes out front, and he walks across the valley. And he sees something on the other side of the valley. He sees a little dust kicking up. And he sees a man running, but he notices the sword is not unsheathed. He notices the spear is not held high. And he, as the man gets closer, he begins to notice that his facial expression is not one of anger, revenge, or bitterness. It's one of joy. Talk about confusing for Jacob. 97 years been scared of that guy. And that guy is smiling at him. Talk about Talk about a moment. It's happening so fast. I think Jacob, my opinion, he just stopped. He's stunned. So Esau runs the entire distance and embraces him and kisses him. It's just like the prodigal son story where the father runs to meet the son. This is the Old Testament moment here where Esau begins to greet him. Imagine Jacob in that moment. I think Jacob got up that day thinking, you know what? This might be my, my, my last day being alive. I actually deserve to die because of what I've done to that man. So he was ready and the exact opposite happened. So Esau he embraces him, kisses him, and Jacob is stunned. And Esau says something like this. He said, why do you send me all these gifts? I, have, I am fairly wealthy. And Jacob's like, no, please. And you can, you can read the story. They argue back and forth, which is so great. A little comedy humor in their moment. They argue back and forth. Finally, Esau says, okay, I'll take it. I'm like, dude, take the stuff, man. Take it. And then they go on their way. What I want to do today is I want to give a moment for people to stand in just a moment. If this message resonates with you at all, in that you know you may have been running you may not be 97, you may be 20, you might be 30, you might be 40. It doesn't really matter what age you are. But you know that you've been hiding your dysfunction and projecting something else. And I think the thing, that's the thing that we do as people, we project something else because we're hiding something. If this message resonates with you, I want to pray for you today. Because I feel like the Lord's going to introduce you to Prince of Peace and Wonderful Counselor because I just met them recently. I'll tell you what, they're awesome. So if that's you, I want you to stand. If you want freedom today, you want to stop running, and you want to stop being freaked out of your mind. And you want to have an encounter with God so he can introduce you to yourself. I want you to stand to your feet. We're going to pray for you. If you're by someone that's standing, if you could be so kind and, and go stand next to them. This is incredibly courageous for everyone that's standing. 
It's so vulnerable to stand in a room of this many people and no one knows the reason. The other thing I noticed is that Jacob never blamed his mom or dad. Jacob had every reason and excuse to say, well, this is how I was raised. You see, Jacob had reached the end of his road. He said, it's no longer about how I was raised or my circumstance or my upbringing. It's about me. And so people that are standing right now, none of us know their story, but yet they have the courage to stand. So I think this is an incredible family moment. And if you're on Bethel TV and, and you can stand in your living room or your house or wherever you're at, please stand. And if someone's there with you, have them put their hands on you. If you're by yourself, we are with you in heart. So Father, this morning, I declare this room would have major encounters with you in the coming days that they would have a moment with you like Jacob did, like I did, and I know many others. Well, when they met you, you introduced us to us, that you would get beneath the layers and layers and layers of life, the layers and layers of experiences, the layers and layers of moments. And we are done projecting our exterior blessing and still living in internal dysfunction. That ends today. And so I ask for the grace of the Lord, the Prince of Peace, the mighty counselor to be introduced to their life today. That even tonight, in the next 24 hours, they will receive the greatest Christmas gift that could ever be given right now. And that is freedom from our own internal crisis and dysfunction. And so I just bless you in the name of the Lord. I pray for grace and peace and protection over you in this moment that you'd have the ability to hear the word of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, that you get to the core of who you really are, and you be known as the freest, happiest person on the face of the earth. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast is now being translated in several languages. Visit podcasts.ibethel.org.